Welcome everyone to the California Department of Education uh, for today's Ethnic Studies informational series specific to African American studies. My name is Cindy Quiralde. I am policy advisor to State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurmond. And we wanna welcome you to today's kickoff uh, for our series. I will be introducing uh, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurmond, to give some welcome remarks to set the tone for today's session. State Superintendent. Thank you, Cindy. Um, thank you all for joining us. Good afternoon and welcome to call the classroom. Uh, the topic today is ethnic studies. Uh, for those of you who are not immediately familiar with ethnic studies, I think you're in for a treat. Uh, you, you have an opportunity to learn about ethnic studies and what that movement has meant uh, for many in our country. And at a time when we're experiencing police brutality and racism, uh, crimes against African Americans, Latinos, Native American, and, and Asian Pacific Islander folks in our state and in our nation, we think that ethnic studies uh, provides us with something very special uh, to share and a special story to tell. Uh, today you'll meet some of the members of the Youth Advisory uh, Commission that I've uh, appointed here at the California Department of Education. They've been asking to learn more about ethnic studies. We wanna thank them uh, for sharing. You'll hear from some other students who've been interns, who've been on the state board, who've served in uh, various organizations throughout our state. And I wanna thank them for saying, let us have positive representations of young people um, in our state and in our nation. You'll also hear from some of my great uh, formal colleagues in the legislature. They're in the legislature, but I'm formally in the legislature. Um, it, it's a special treat to hear first from Assemblymember Medina, uh, who has been a, an instructor and professor and, and, and educator in Chicano studies and ethnic studies. Um, and then you'll also hear from uh, also another great educator, Assemblymember Dr. Shirley Weber, um, who is a premier uh, and a professor of Africana studies and ethnic studies and will share an incredible historical perspective uh, with you. And so we're excited uh, that you're joining us on this journey. Today kicks off what's a four part series uh, that we wanna share, uh, including various disciplines in ethnic studies. So we hope that you will uh, tune in with us, stay with us, learn with us, uh, and continue to be the difference in the world that we need to see during these very challenging times. I'm gonna turn it back to Cindy so that we can hear from some of the members of our Youth Advisory Commission. Thank you, Superintendent. And like the superintendent said, you know, we are, are thrilled today to provide this space to provide a, a, a sort of a virtual classroom to hear um, from powerful educators and to hear the voices of students, because we understand that what is occurring in our streets right now um, and across our country is, is impact of, you know, racial injustices as well as social justice issues that we know have deep roots. And we're hoping that today can provide a format for students to learn more. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, uh, Youth Advisory Council member Siobhan Hines Foster to share a bit about um, her experience with ethnic studies, as well as to introduce um, our esteemed guests. Siobhan? Hi, everyone. My name Hello. is Siobhan Hines Foster. I'm the student delegate to the San Francisco Board of Education, and I'll be introducing Assembly Member Jose Medina. Assemblymember Jose Medina was elected in November 2012 to represent California's 61st Assembly District, which consists of Riverside, Moreno Valley, Paris, and Mead Valley. He currently serves as a chair of the Assembly Committee on Higher Education. A former educator, Mr. Medina cares deeply about education and works to champion policies that improve the lives of students across the state. He believes that an educated workforce is the critical success to California. Mr. Medina's eagerness to assist students beyond the classroom motivated him to pursue public office. He served as a school board member on the Jerupa Unified School District Board of Education and completed three successful terms on the Riverside County College District Board of Trustees. Mr. Medina recognizes the critical role higher education plays in supporting jobs and opening the doors for opportunity. During his first term in the assembly, Mr. Medina led the effort to ensure University of California Riverside School of Medicine received 15 million in ongoing funds through the state cheat 
through the state budget. In 2018, Mr. Medina also secured $9.7 million to support the development of the Cheech Marin Center of Chicano Art, Culture, and Industry of the Riverside Art Museum, also known as the Cheech. The Cheech will reside in the city of Riverside and be a permanent home for Cheech's Marin collection of Chicano art, making it the most prominent collection of its kind in the U.S. and boosting tourism in the Inland Empire. Assemblymember Medina is a proud UC Riverside alumnus with a bachelor's degree in Latin American studies and a master's degree in history. He has two adult children and two grandchildren. He currently resides in Riverside with his wife, Linda. Thank you for that, Siobhan. Assemblymember Medina, would you be so kind? Yes, uh, first uh, I wanna thank uh, Siobhan for that wonderful introduction and thank our state superintendent, uh, Tony Thurman for uh, putting this together and uh, the students for being here. Um, two things I wanna share about being an ethnic studies teacher uh, here in Riverside. Uh, I, I got to see firsthand uh, in the many years that I was able to teach uh, ethnic studies here at in Poly High School in Riverside, the power of ethnic studies the power that ethnic studies has to motivate and empower students. And that's what I saw in my classroom. I saw students transformed. I saw tr students transformed into uh, being very independent uh, seekers of knowledge and feeling of empowerment. And that I think is what happens across the state with students who have the opportunity to see themselves reflected uh, in ethnic studies. And that is what motivated me to introduce Assembly Bill 331 to make ethnic studies a high school graduation requirement. And with that, it is my honor, privilege to introduce a, a great friend and someone who I am proud to serve with in the California legislature. And that is uh, our next speaker, my good friend and colleague, Assemblywoman Dr. Shirley Weber. Dr. Weber? We, okay. Well, first of all, thanks to my good friend, uh, uh, Mr. Medina, who uh, is a strong advocate for education, for higher ed, and for uh, ethnic studies. And so uh, him having uh, been a professor or an educator in, in the um, uh, field of ethnic studies made us obviously attracted to each other uh, because I've spent the last 40 years of my life as a professor at San Diego State and well and, and one of the founders of ethnic studies and so Africana studies in particular the first entity in terms of uh, ethnic studies and so uh, I, so I'm here today really excited because I haven't been in a classroom in a good little while so it always makes me uh, excited when I have students who are hopefully eager to learn and have lots and lots of questions to ask of me. So I want to try it as much as possible to make it interactive, to ask you questions and have you respond to some of the things that are really important. Um, you know, when we talk about um, education, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's an extremely important issue and particularly in African American communities. And uh, probably because uh, of all the individuals in this country you know, who were limited in terms of their ability to go to school. Uh, none had more laws written against them in terms of their desire, uh, in terms of allowing them to be taught to read and write than Africans who in this country. In fact, it was against the law to, for them to learn to read. And if, it, and if they were caught reading, uh, they could be lynched, they could be burned, they could have been hung, they could have been, in essence, they would have been killed if someone had discovered that they could read or that and if someone had taught them to read, they could also be imprisoned and other kinds of things such as that. So to have the force of the entire country against your education is quite phenomenal. And so as a result of that, when we look at what African Americans attempted to achieve, it becomes really important uh, that we look at it in that context. Of, of, of all the obstacles and challenges they face just to be able to read. One of the things that I wanna, and I'm gonna ask some questions and if you can answer by whatever means that they have given you, I'd like to hear you talk, hear your response. You know, when I was a kid, I used to um, see these movies and it was always interesting to me that these movies where somebody was conquering somebody else, they'd have these big 
burnings that occurred. And these burnings were really burning books. And they would go in and they would take all these books and they'd throw them in the middle of some village somewhere and, and set them on fire, you know. And, and then I read later on about the burning of, the, of, of Alexandria, the famous library. And, uh, and I had the good fortune to go visit that library in Alexandria a few years ago. But to, to, uh, to hear about that made me question and wonder, why would anybody want to burn a book? You know, I mean, what danger is there in doing that? I could see if you wanted to steal all the gold and all the, the, the special stuff that you could then transfer uh, into wealth for yourself. But this was, this was a regular kind of thing that occurred in, in, in the early centuries that, that people went in and burned books and scrolls and things of that nature. Can any of you think of the reason why? Um, and I, and I, don't, I, I don't know if I see hands or, or what I see, but is there anyone who actually knows? Just speak up if you have an idea as to why this was occurring. Nobody has, a, has a, a thought as to why would this occur? I look like Amen wants, wants to smile. Is that correct? Who wants to answer uh, the question? Not yet. Okay. Can you hear me? I, I can hear yeah. you, yes. So my response to your question is just that books hold facts in them. And some facts, some people would not like to see the light. And people would like to hide the facts. And so that's why people burn books. And that's why we see a lot in media when people are conquered, they destroy their whole their whole cities and their whole towns and they leave nothing but ashes in, in, in the dust. And that's because they want to take apart the history of that culture and leave behind no traces of what was there. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, it's extremely important. Paulo Fierre, who wrote the book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, talked about how people take information and try to, uh, if they destroy your history, and destroy all of your past and, and, and then forbid you to learn about it, eventually you will believe whatever you've been told. You will become the person that someone else creates because you won't have the counter information. It's almost like, you know, when we looked at the, the movie um, uh, that had the, the astronauts, you know, the, 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 the women, the hidden figures, you know, most of us were shocked that these women, these African-American women had a central role to play in, in, in the space uh, industry. We had no idea whatsoever. And so most of us were shocked, shocked. And I said to my colleagues in, at the assembly when we were talking about black history one time, I said, what would happen, would have happened if that information was common knowledge uh, for young African-Americans to know that, that their ancestors, that these women were basically, you know, pushing the, the envelope in the area of space travel. And it was their calculations and their information that basically was, was the responsible for the success of the industry. C can you imagine what women would think about? So when we try to do all these things of STEM education and all these things to, in to interest women in engineering and science and, and mathematics, uh, if they had really understood who these women were, uh, these African-American women who were doing this amazing work, and yet none of us knew about it. And now we think women don't do science, women don't do math, women don't do engineering. And, uh, and yet when we looked at that movie, it was like a shock. It was like, what? We, many folks didn't think it was true. And eventually we saw the real, one of the real women who, was, who, was, who recently passed away. But, but that becomes a shock to us because this is information that we didn't have. And so information can be empowering and it, it empowers the person who has it and it gives you a probably a different idea of what your past is about. And so that's one of the reasons why I tell my colleagues all the time in, in, in the assembly that history is really important because it's not just about memorizing facts, it's about shaping your character. It's about helping you become the person that you can become because you stand on the shoulders of individuals who've either struggled really hard and made some success or, or you see how hard they struggled and, and others worked against them so that you understand their failure now because you know what the history says. And as a result, you then are empowered to take that history and use it yourself. And so, so it becomes important. So when I used to see these people burning these books, I'm like, what is this? You know, don't you have something else to do besides burn a book? <laughs> and then as I, was, as I got older and began to read, I realized, oh, they were taking these people's memory of themselves and destroying it. And once you take that memory, then you can replace it with any information you want. And because you have no counter information, you have nothing to counter it, you then have the information that's there. You know, so it becomes important as we talk about history, 
and how this history factors into the kinds of things we need to learn. Um, I was, you know, in, in, my, in my own discussion, as I was talking to, with the superintendent, I said, you know, I should probably talk about, and I'm gonna talk about the history of the development of Africana studies and ethnic studies, because that becomes important because oftentimes we don't talk about its history, how it came into existence, what kind of sacrifices people made to get it going. And as a result, we look at it today and think, oh, that's nice. You know, they wanna do a little study of themselves. They want a little bit of history. And yet we don't have this level of appreciation for it because we don't know how hard they struggle to get it. And we don't understand some of the challenges that they face. You know, as I said, when I think about history, I think about all the, um, all the challenges that African-Americans faced in order to be educated. And so this whole desire to know the, about themselves is not just a 1960 event, even though that happened in the, the, the development in the 60s, and we see it today, uh, but it really goes back much earlier, a long time ago, in terms of uh, various desires to, to have education, to learn about themselves, and to do all those things. Uh, as a result of that, you know, you have the development of, um, it's interesting, the development of black colleges and, uh, and, and what that meant to those communities. Who knows what, um, approximately what year the very first black college was developed? Does anybody know? Does anybody have that information, the very first HBCU? Uh, when it started. Does anybody know when it, when it started? That's just as a guess. Anybody can just speak up and tell me what, what date they thought it was. Anybody have any information? 1865. 1865. Why do you say 1865? Um, wasn't Clark Atlanta the first HBCU? Oh, no. No. No? Okay. Oh, okay. But it's good, but Clark Atlanta is an old history. Anybody else know a date? Was it, was it Bethune-Cookman? Was that the first one? No, no. Bethune-Cookman came in the late 1800s with, uh, uh, with uh, Miss Cookman. Yeah, with, with Bethune, Mary McLeod Bethune, and, and combining with Cookman College. You know, the very first college was Cheney in Pennsylvania, and it was in 1837. 1837. The first black college was developed in 1837. The second one was in, also in Pennsylvania in 1854. And so what happens is that oftentimes we think it came with the Emancipation Proclamation, that when, when, when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and eventually all the slaves became eventually freed, as we found out in Juneteenth in 1865, we thought, okay, that's when people really began to have an interest in education. But it really started before that. It started when there was still slavery in the United States, 18, 1837, Cheney University. And, uh, and it's interesting because of, uh, it was started by, by, by African Americans and some religious groups to start Cheney and the same is true at Lincoln University. And eventually Wilberforce was in 1856. So we had colleges, black colleges being developed before the end of slavery. And that's important to understand because as you're talking about um, what, what people did and how, what, what their values were and why would they do these things and those kinds of things, it's because they believe so strongly in education and they wanted to know more about themselves. And so they began to develop colleges. And right now, how many black, how many HBCUs do you think we have in this country right now? And a few of them have, 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 have stopped operating. How many do you think we have? 30, 35. 30, 35, right, no, far off. How many do you think there are? There's 107 HBCUs in the United States, 107. And I say this because when you don't have the information, you sometimes don't really appreciate how extensive it is. There are 107 HBCUs in the United States. And so that talks about how we invested in education. So when I, have, when I was on the school board, people would say, well, I don't think black families really are interested in education, or I don't think black people are that interested in education. And if they were more interested, they would be excelling like this group and that group. And then I'd have to ask the critical question, I said, how many other groups have developed colleges for their people to go to school? And they would stop and have to think, well, any other groups? And, and, and they couldn't, I said, and so despite all the laws against us being able to read, to write, uh, limitations, uh, um, in terms of segregation of schools, those kinds of things, black people built colleges. They built colleges. Now, that, states, that is a statement about how we believe in education that we, we build colleges, not just Spelman and, and, and Morehouse and the Howard and the ones we could think of, 107 HBCUs in the United States, 107. And so it's been important to have that information because that's empowering. 
So when someone asks me, well, what have your people done? You know, you guys don't believe in education. They don't, kids don't do well in school. Then I have to ask the question, why would we build so many colleges if we didn't think education was important? It's like saying black people don't believe in God, yet we have more churches than anybody else around. We all, nobody ever says that because we have so many churches, you know that, that, um, that, we, that everybody believes we believe in religion. But we also believe in education. When you have 107 colleges started by black folks to educate black kids, that's an awful lot of investment in the education of a, of a population. And so I give you this information because it's really important as we talk about education and why we, why we basically ended up in this field called Africana Studies, uh, because we did believe in education very early on. And while we had not developed ethnic studies departments and Africana Studies, when you look at Carter G. Woodson, you find he, he, was a, he was a founder of basically the Negro History Week, you know, because he thought it was important that we needed to learn about our history. And if you went to an HBCU, you sang the Black National Anthem every morning. You learned about Langston Hughes. You know, some of your, your professors might have been W.B. Du Bois, okay? So when you went to a Black college, in addition to the other stuff you learned, you learned Black history is the same thing. And so Black history was taught at Black colleges. It was integrated into the curriculum of the schools. And so those who graduated from those schools learned all of that history, that culture, that literature, all those things. And that may be one of the reasons why when we look at the graduates from HBCUs, they're generally the ones who are basically leading our nation. They're on the, most of them are on, on, if you have blacks on the, on the um, for, uh, Fortune 500 boards, they're mostly graduates from HBCUs, you know? And, and, and they're generally, we have more doctors and lawyers coming out of HBCUs, why? Because of the education they get. Mr. Medina talked about the power of that education to, to change how they see themselves and what they do. All of that is a part of this whole discussion of what happens when, when we get engaged with education, how it helps our young people and how it helps us to grow. So that becomes extremely important. Um, and so out of that comes the Black Power Movement of the 60s. And I, I'm gonna hit that very quickly because I know we don't have a lot of time. And um, you know, most of you have seen all the civil rights movements and various kinds of things. But in, in, um, in 19, I think it was 1966, um, there was a, a movement of breast. King was marching in Mississippi. And uh, all of a sudden, because they were being turned around and being abused and so forth and so on, uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, made a statement. He said, what we need is black power. And that wasn't the first time that phrase was used, but it was surely the first time it was chanted loudly and picked up by the media. And in that discussion of what black power was, they talked about social, political, and economic social, political, economic self-determination. Malcolm X often talked about that in his speech ballot or the bullet. And so as a result, you had young people and people beginning to talk about what does it mean to have economic? What does it mean to have political? And surely what does it mean to have social self-determination? And one of those things that came out was the discussion for Black studies. People wanted to be able to study themselves and that became kind of a rallying cry, kind of like Black Lives Matter right now. You know, the protests are there. And so as a result, uh, people began to ask questions about why don't we have black studies? And so students began to protest across the nation about the need for black studies. The largest and most significant protest was where? Where do you think it was? Where do you think the largest and most significant protest and the longest protest uh, and the most impactful one was held? Anybody know? Anybody know where it was held? Nobody knows? Give me a good guess. What do you think? Can you repeat the question, please? Where was the, where was the, was, where was the most significant uh, movement or protest that took place? Shut down campuses and the whole bit uh, for several months. Where did that take place in the United States? Where? It's upstate. Upsta where? San Francisco State University. Exactly, San Francisco State. San Francisco State uh, was a campus that was an urban campus. Uh, kind of beginning to grow and increase the number of, of black and brown students on campus. Also, you had this, the you have the war uh, movement taking place in terms of people uh, against the Vietnam War, and you had uh, students who were from middle class backgrounds beginning to realize that the campuses were very repressive. Campuses that were not accustomed to dealing with protest and all those kinds of things, and students were making demands. 
And one of those demands was for black studies, uh, as well as a host of other things. And so it became a very diverse group of, of students protesting. And if you get a chance to go onto San Francisco State University's website and, and click on black studies, you will see a lot of the videos. I started to try to show some to you, but it was taking too much of our time. There were all kinds of videos of people protesting and marching, and there were parents and young people and all kinds of folks marching against San Francisco State. They had various, in fact, they shut down the campus from, from November to, uh, from November, uh, to, March, to April of, of 69. So 1968, from November to 1969, April, they shut down the campus. There was no school uh, that took place at San Francisco State. They went through three different presidents uh, because the students were making demands and the presidents couldn't handle it and didn't know what to do. The board of trustees was furious because they wanted total control. And these students were demanding uh, that they have a black studies department. They had put, they had demanded and gotten a, a chair of the department, uh, Nathan Hare, who was kind of interim chair. And so the students were out there protesting every day. They called the police on them. They had the National Guards taking over the campus. They had people being beaten by police officers and these kinds of things you see today. All that took place at San Francisco State. And, they, and the students refused to give it up. They refused to give it up. And, uh, and so it was really interesting that they, they had this huge ongoing battle uh, on campus with all the students protesting and marching. And um, eventually in April, they reached an agreement and that agreement Establish the first black studies department in the nation to actually have a department. Others had had a class of this or that, but San Francisco State had the first department and the first degree program of any campus in the United States. And we should be proud of that because that was at San Francisco State. And immediately campuses across the state began to develop. Uh, UCLA, we had protested when I was a student at UCLA, we had protests at UCLA in 69. We had protests at Cal State Northridge. I had friends who were actually thrown out of school because they were protesting. Students took over buildings uh, and, and, and kept the buildings shut down for weeks and weeks and weeks, demanding ethnic studies, demanding a department be established in most of the campuses. And, uh, and so this whole movement began kind of like today with all the students out there protesting and people's like, the students have gone crazy. You know, they're, they're, they're not in class. They should go to class. They're not doing anything significant. And no one really understood what the students were doing except for some of the faculty who were engaged. Uh, and most folks at the time I was a student thought we were all crazy and, uh, and that we, <laughs> we just didn't want to go to class. And so that was our way of getting out of, of going to class and doing homework. But, uh, but most campuses were protesting to establish the ethnic studies, the Africana Studies Department. And then from that, others start saying, we need it too. You know, our Chicano studies, our Chicano brothers and sisters just started Chicano studies. And then we had Native American studies and we had API studies. And then we had women's studies that came in as well. So most of the other groups began to realize that the education their kids were getting was inadequate. And so they wanted these departments and they wanted them to be established. So it's important when we look at that, that, um, uh, that we see all of these things taking place but it's interesting to me that even though it started um and uh in 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 69 uh it took it's taken now 50 years for it to actually become um i wouldn't say recognized because right now we have not only bachelor's degrees we have AA degrees we have bachelor's degrees we have master's degrees and we have phds in in africana studies uh, across the nation and uh and you we're fortunate because california has the most significant number of ethnic of, of Africana studies and Chicano studies, uh, any ethnic studies department, California has the largest number of them than any other state. I I was the national chair of the National Council for Black Studies for a number of years, and uh, we saw the growth of ethnic studies in all these different states. And some states were just getting departments, like in in 2003 and four and what have you. And California had already had those departments, and it now has celebrated. It's in its 51st year. Of, of basically having an, an Africana studies department. And now they have one of the few uh, ethnic studies colleges in San Francisco State. But it was not an easy journey. I can tell you uh, at San Diego State, I went to San Diego State in 1972. And I went there at the time I was a PhD student. I went there because um, this, uh, like most things, there was protests. The students had burned trash cans at the president's office. And, uh, and threatened the president if they didn't get Africana studies as a department. 
And so uh, the president resisted and one thing after another, but they realized they could not uh, continue to resist the students. And so uh, as a result, they brought in this guy named Harold Brown, who then um, hired all of us uh, as faculty members. And he was smart because he did not want us hired to just be faculty and be vulnerable. He made them hire us on tenure track. He said, if these people are going to work here, they got to have power. They got to be able to get tenured. They got to be able to serve on personnel committees. They got to do all these things because if you don't do that, then as soon as the larger society decides that you're no longer desirable or students stop protesting, then they can get rid of all of you. You know, they can just reduce your budget and you don't exist. They can't do that if you're tenured faculty. And so Harold insisted that we all be hired on tenure track and we work and we all we became tenured and professors and full professors and basically participated in the life and the development of, uh, of that campus. But every day there was some protest, just about, and every semester there was some effort to try to destroy, to minimize, to attack Africana studies. And, um, and, and it, was, it was constant. Uh, they wanted to blend us into their own departments. We resisted that. They wanted to defund the departments. We resisted that. They wanted to make Africana studies, Chicano studies, Native American studies, and API all in one department and call us one big conglomerate of ethnic studies. We resisted that because even though we shared some similar things, we were very different people. You know, there's a very different history between uh, Chicanos and, Af and African Americans in terms of in this country, very different than APIs. So we're all very different. And even though we shared, we respect each other's challenges, we are not the same. And so we refuse to be put into the same program with each other. And, uh, and so that was a battle. We, and so what happened, we began to understand that if this department is to survive, it will survive because we have tremendous support from our community. And so we then began to not only build our students as a base of support, but we began to reach out to the, to the black community and the Chicano community and begin to serve the students and to tutor high school students and develop a whole connection between the university and the communities that had not existed before. And so therefore, when they got ready to come after one of us, we could always respond because we could call the community and say, come get them, you know, come defend us. And the community would come. And that was the unique thing about ethnic studies is that it had a community that was, that was willing to always be there and fight for them. Uh, right before I left the university, I was uh, fighting to get my, my position uh, funded because I was leaving, I was going to the assembly and I thought that they needed to replace me. You know, they needed to give more uh, positions to the faculty. And they didn't want to do that. They, they said, well, we don't want to do it. And they hadn't given us a position in years. They didn't want to do it. And so I just decided that, um, you know, I was going to go to war about this. So my, my position was, uh, if you don't give us a position, then I will make it so that the president of this university cannot go into any community organization, black organization in San Diego and be accepted. I said, you will be persona non grata in every church, every NAACP, every urban league, everywhere you go in Southeast San Diego, you will be rejected. And uh, it was funny because, it, it, as usual, the president sent a spy into the meeting with us, and he went back and told him. Uh, and the president asked the question, can she do that? And he said, not only she can, but she will. <laughs> you know, and so that was, that was like the deal. And so as a result, we got the position we wanted. But we've always had to fight, fight, fight struggle. And the strength of the departments always rests in our ability to pull in and to bring in our communities to help us to fight these battles. And so as we even right now talk about ethnic studies at the state level, um, there are probably a whole bunch of my friends on this, uh, as participants, because a lot of educators knew I was doing this today. But CFA, the various uh, community organizations, the unions, all those black folks who teach ethnic studies are lobbying the governor, lobbying why? Because just like it was in 1968 and 69, the board of trustees do not want to have us have ethnic studies at the university. It requires students just to take three credits. That's all, just three credits. Not three classes, three credits. And so, so we've had to call in the community to say, hey, you know, we got to weigh in on this. We got to fight for this. We got to fight for that. And people say, well, you, don't you think you should wait for the system to, to, to embrace you? Well, we've done that before, and it's never really worked. And so the power of ethnic studies has always been its ability to leverage its political and its social influence on institutions to make change. And then once we do, you know, uh, we move on to the next issue, but it becomes extremely important 
It's the only discipline that actually grew out of protest. And that's important to understand. So when people ask, why are these students in the street protesting? Because sometimes when you try the regular route like King did, you have to protest in the end. You have to come back to the basics. You have to go back and say, okay, we got to lobby around this. We got to make sure we don't vote for this person versus that person. We got to make sure, as, as Adam Clayton Powell, don't, 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 don't buy where you can't work so you don't support this business. And those are the things you learn as strategies when you uh, study ethnic studies and you become a part of it. So I just wanted to give you that information. I'm going to open it up for questions. We can always talk about other things if you want to, talk about what the curriculum was like and what the political environment was like and as a faculty member on campuses when you're fighting for these things to happen. But I wanted you to get it because I wanted you to understand uh, just how important this is, not just as a political battle, but that this is a part of the development and the growth of this community. That, uh, that if African Americans are to survive and Latinos are to survive in the way in which they need to survive on these campuses and in these communities, it'll be because they have information about themselves. And information is power. That's why people burn books. That's why people refuse to let people read and write because information is power. And it's, and, and it's just like what my father told me when I was a kid and he only got a chance to go to school for, to the sixth grade because they wouldn't let him go. He said, once you get it, nobody can take it from you. Once you get that knowledge, once you have that information, it is yours to keep. And, uh, and so it becomes important to understand that these are the things that you learn, these are the skills you have, and it helps you to grow and to develop and to the, be the young person that you think you want to be and to accomplish the goals that are there. But ethnic studies has a long history, long history, but, it, but when you stand on that history and you know it, um, you will appreciate it. You will appreciate this long struggle that even we're in right now, just to get ethnic studies into our school. That is not anything unusual. If it had happened without any conflict, I would have been shocked, <laughs> personally shocked, because I've never had ethnic studies ever just roll in. King says change doesn't roll in on the wheels of inevitability. In other words, it just doesn't happen. You have to make it happen. And that's basically what we're doing in terms of ethnic studies. And hopefully you will benefit immensely from it and make sure your children do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weber. I just want to say thank you so much for giving us that full background and understanding about the um, transformative power of ethnic studies. And I can say, you know, as a as a former Chicano Latino studies uh, major myself, I can speak to that, the power that it can provide and and the transformative aspects of, you know, seeing yourself in history and knowing you can change, you know, the circumstances in your community. So thank you. Um, I want to be able to provide space for the students to share any reflections or comments or questions. So the floor is open. Um, students feel free to jump in and ask questions for Dr. Weber. Um, yes, I have a question. Thank you so much, Dr. Weber, um, for educating us on the history of this all. Um, so I'm a upcoming sophomore at Stanford University. I'm a double major in urban studies and comparative studies and race and ethnicity. And one of the issues that I faced in my campus is the fact that, you know, if people are teaching African American, African studies, Chicano Latino studies, Asian American studies, what is a common um, thing is that a lot of the professors are not professors of color, they are white professors. And so did you find yourself having that issue when you were organizing or do you feel like this is something that has been brought up recently and how do you think young people can organize um, in order to change that? You know, that's, that's been one of the, uh, the main issues that's, that's been in, in the area of ethnic studies. And, um, and I think it takes, a very, um, a, a, it takes a very special person who's not a person of color to teach ethnic studies to thoroughly understand it because it's more than just recording the information. It's basically helping to analyze and understand the information that you see from a different perspective. And that's why it is so important. So you may have some folks who, who can, um, and they should be willing to understand that they are limited sometimes in their analysis of what they see, you know, that, that there's a different perspective on, on, on how you see it. I once had a professor, we had a, we, had a, we had a guy who was in our department, a white guy in our department who taught in our department. And, um, and it was really interesting because someone had said in, in one of the lectures, they said, uh, what would you do, what would be the first thing you'd do if you were free uh, from slavery? And, uh, and so he, he, he said, uh, 
uh, I would uh, I would kill the master. Okay, that's the first thing he said he would do because they had sold his kids and his family and everything else. So he said first thing he'd do would kill the master if he was free. Uh, so this guy wrote on the board and he wrote something really negative like, oh, you'd be a murderer or you'd be something like that. And someone, another guy raised his hand and said, oh, oh you do murder or something. He said, and, then, and another guy says, no, he would do justice. And they had this big conflict and the guy refused to accept the fact that this guy was talking justice. And I said, if someone had basically killed your wife, killed your kids, destroyed your family, uh, and you did something to them, it may not be fit into your world, but in his world, it might have been justice. It might have been because you don't know all what he's been through. And it was very difficult for this faculty member to acknowledge the fact that in his world, you know, that would always be wrong because he had never had anything happen that, to him. And so I tried to explain to him that his world was limited and he needed to begin to understand what was happening in the minds of those who were there. So it becomes really challenging. That's one of the reasons why it's so very important that the campuses work hard to make sure that they have at least the, the majority of the faculty in those groups, uh, in, those, in those departments that are, that are basically African-American. There are some like Aptek and some great scholars who've been able to teach for years and have done extremely well because they realize that their experiences are limited. And, 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 and rather than imposing their view on this person in a, in a very domineering way, uh, ask the students to research it. I, like I told this, this faculty who was a person on my faculty, when they had a conflict about uh, uh, some historical information, what was accurate or inaccurate, I said, rather than dominating the students, have them go do the research. Make it an assignment so they can come back and defend their position. And if they can defend their position, that's great because most of the time, history is no more than analysis of facts. And what you see and don't see ought to be based on a lot of information rather than just one person's view of the world. So it becomes important that, that those who, if they're not teaching and they're not African-American and not Latino and what have you, you may want to make sure that they understand that, that, that the material they're teaching comes from a different perspective. And that's a unique thing in Africana studies and Chicano studies. It's a perspective in which the, analysis, the material is presented, not just the factual information that's there, but a thorough understanding of the culture and how that information impacts the lives of those that you're going to teach. And that becomes really important. Yeah. So good luck with it. And I think students need to insist and, per and persist because sometimes it's easy to just pick somebody to teach. You know, when you want someone in ethnic studies to not only teach the subject matter, but you want them to be a mentor to students and you want them to go that extra mile to motivate students. Because when you listen to a lot of students, they'll tell you, even my colleagues in the assembly, when they talk about their, their experience in, at college in, in Chicano studies and Africana studies, they not only talk about the information they got and how it changed their view of the world, but they also talk about those mentors in those departments that helped them to grow and to stay at those universities. And that's critical. And that is very, very critical. So that uh, as I was talking to Mr. Thurman the other day, he was talking about some of my, my former students. I have thousands of students across the country. And mainly because I've been trying to be a mentor to them. I've tried to help them to grow and to develop. And I've done more than just give them the information and walk out the classroom. Because I know that they're in a campus that's alienating and they may need to be in a position where they can call a faculty member, ask me questions that, they, that they're too embarrassed to ask anybody else because it may indicate that they don't really know the information, but to basically somebody who can shepherd them through the campus and help them to become the professional they want to become. And that's really, really important for, for, for uh, when you're on a campus and there are very few people of color. Uh, you need a mentor. And I still relate to my mentor today, Malefi Asante in Philadelphia. And he was the only black person on my, on my campus. And he helped me through the most difficult times as I constantly faced racism and various kinds of things when I was a student. Malefi was always there for me. And even as a professional, professional he has always been there for me. Uh, and and that, I could not have bought that. There, would have been, there was no one else in that department who, could, who, would, who helped me and mentored me like Malefi Asante. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Weber. Um, I don't have a question, but I do have a long comment. Okay. So my name is Jonathan Piper II. I'm from East Oakland, California. Um, my major is in political science. I do attend community college. Um, my goal is to transfer to an HBCU, preferably Howard, um, and continue my studies there. Um, and I just, I love when information makes sense. You know, what you have said has really connected with me and resonated because of some of the other experiences that I have, you know, gone through. Mm -hmm. um, 
I took a dual enrollment ethnic studies course in high school and it was my favorite class. You know, we had to stay after school in order to be a part of it. And I was ready to get out of my other classes, but I was super excited to stay after class to take ethnic studies um, and to learn more about my culture and other cultures, right? Um, and then when I got into community college, I found myself in the Umoja program, which was all my classes were centered around black culture, right? And so now I wanna go into HBCU just to continue that. So I represent Kingmakers of Oakland, which is an organization that supports with providing these type of services to um, students, right, in school. And we have a book, it's called We Dare Say Love. Um, and in this book, I found a quote which really resonated with how this whole conversation is going. So if I have a second just to share it. Sure. Um, it says, we do, not, we do not intend to suggest that it is useless to engage in identity and social behavioral work with black male students or that educational strategy should focus solely on structure. As Pedro Nagoria has pointed out, we must work to engage both structural and cultural approaches. There is a need to synthesize both structural and cultural explanations of human behavior to best support Black students. Structural and cultural forces combine in complex ways to influence the formation of individual and collective identities, even as individuals may resist actively or passively the various processes involved in the molding of the self. And so that was from our book um, and that just um, some of the curriculum that Kingmakers of Oakland has that has actually been accredited um, and is available um, is within like the revolutionary of literature, um, the, depth, the depth of hip hop, you know, the arguments of freedom, the mastering of our cultural identity. And these are all resources. So I know you said, um, somebody said when the slaves were waiting to be free, what's the first thing that they wanted to do? Kill the masters. Um, I don't condone murder, but I'm, what I wanted to say is that I don't feel like we need to wait to be free in order to liberate ourselves. You know, we have these resources out there. We should be able to obtain those and use them now to, to make ourselves free instead of waiting, right? And so back then, knowledge was criminal. You get killed for knowledge, but now we have access to it and we have laptops and iPads and we can just access it whenever we want, right? Um, you talked about Hidden Figures, but another movie that spoke about Black power and the innovation within Black culture was the movie Black Panther, right? Mm -hmm. They had all these technology, and I even bought some Komodo beads that they used because <laughs> I just thought I loved the representation. Um, and I just talked about, I love how it shows how Black culture has really been super influential in how society operates. And you're like, hip hop, hip hop is culture. And when you understand hip hop, you can teach anybody because it's universal, right? A lot of people are using that type of culture to understand themselves. Um, and that even when you understand hip hop and black culture, you can understand your surrounding, right? So if you're in Oakland and you see hip hop going down in the hyphy movement and even the knowledge of the N word, a lot of people talk about how they want to use the N word because their friends use it or because they hear it in a hip hop song. But with ethnic studies and like the black education that you get in school, you learn the power of that word and the negativity. And then I think that really helps us to combat it. Like this word was used to oppress people. And it also stems from the, the Ethiopian word negus, N-E-G-U-S, which meant king. Mm -hmm. And so how do we change that narrative? And um, I just appreciate this opportunity to, to talk about ethnic studies and how it can help support our communities of color with understanding themselves and then understanding their places in the world because that's what helped me and now i want to use that opportunity to help other people so just thank you for being here for prov providing all of that knowledge and thanks to the other panelists who are also involved um and i'm just super excited to be a part of this conversation and talk about how we can spread ethnic studies and african-american studies throughout education well, you know, one of the things that I uh, <clears throat> that I've discovered is that um, and that, that there is a tremendous thirst in young people for knowledge of self, you know, and, and an appreciation of self. And um, uh, before I left uh, the university, I mean, well, before yeah, before I left the, the university, I had started a program at one of the high schools, and it was uh, my girlfriend had started a group called the uh, um, um, the Diamonds in the Rough. And, uh, and so uh, I was traveling back and forth to South Africa and decided, well, you know, we should try to uh, teach these students and take them with me to South Africa. And, um, and so it was interesting because uh, we started just on, on the day that the students had, didn't have class. Uh, they had half a day, so it was a Wednesday. 
and they were out of school in at 12 or one o'clock because teachers had staff development or whatever and and so these students would have to come uh, when they were out of school i mean you know it was, school was over like 11 30 or whatever it was and they would show up for a class that was free no credit on, on african-american history and it was shocking to us that they would be rushing to get to this class with us to have this weekly conversation and uh and then they start bringing their friends of other ethnic backgrounds and so we didn't know with 50 60 kids uh who, who are there at the diamond in the rough meeting after school talking about uh african-american history and uh, i took them to allensworth to see the black town every year and then those who wanted to started raising their money and every year i took five of them to south africa and uh you know it was just an amazing experience for them because they got a chance to learn about black history and then I did the same similar program for at the W.B. Du Bois Institute. We started with the NAACP, with the, uh, the NAACP. And it was interesting because I kept telling people, you know, we, we, we get kids who are struggling in school. <clears throat> and when, then when they come to our, come after school they, or, or on weekends, they, we give them more of the same stuff that they were struggling with all week long, rather than giving them something to motivate them to want to improve. And so we started with the Du Bois Institute and teaching these kids about black history on Saturday. And it really motivated them to want to read more and improve their reading skills and their other skills. Why? Because now we were teaching them about who they were and how important they were in the world and what responsibility they had to continue that. And it motivated these kids. They were eight, nine, 10 years old and 11. And it's interesting, the first trip I took to Africa, they motivated me to go to Africa because I had met Du Bois's son at a conference and i told him i said i have an organization named after your father and he goes well i live in egypt and we've got to talk back and forth he said why don't you take them to the du bois institute in accra in ghana and i said okay so when i went back that saturday i was joking when i said to the kids uh you know who i met and i told him i said and he invited us to come to ghana to the du bois institute and the kids said let's go and i said do you know how far that is and they said yeah, and they showed worlds in the map. I said, do you know how much it might cost? They said, Dr. Weber, you told us we could do anything we want to do if we put our mind to it. And what could I say? I said, okay, let's get ready. <laughs> and my first trip to Africa was with these kids in the Du Bois Institute. So, you know, kids are motivated. They're motivated when they see themselves and they hear themselves and they believe they have unlimited ability to grow and to develop. And that's what you're finding, you know. And once that spark is in you, it will be there forever. It will be there forever. You will always be challenging yourself and sharing that knowledge with those that you meet along the way. So it's great. Wish you well. Can I say something? Sure. Uh, so for me, when you talked about earlier, I would like to earlier again, thank you for what you said earlier, because hearing a lot of new information for me is always very exciting because I get to like go on my own head and just kind of philosophize or philosophize around the ideas. But for me, I feel like I would like to acknowledge how for us, this is called ethnic studies, but we all know about Christopher Columbus and other like Greek mythology. Like we all know about these other types of history that are embedded in our education and society already. So why is it that when we want to learn about ourselves, it, it, it becomes not just history itself, it's ethnic studies. Like the fact that we have to go out of our way to even learn about ourselves is such a big hoop to jump through especially when you're younger, you don't even know where to start. And so the stigma that's been, like the historical stigma around education for black people is still around to this day. And then the destruction of history is like, literally it makes it so hard for us to identify with, with history. We don't know where our place is at until we hopefully one day get into an ethnic studies class or a a class where we get to learn about the history of civil rights or the history of where our people went through to be free and once you learn those things it really does put in perspective your role in society and what types of things you should be striving for what types of things you come from again like you said in hidden figures if black women knew from the beginning that they have been astronauts we would have a lot of more black women in stem we would ha have a lot of more black women striving to be in those types of fields and it's the same with 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 all of us with all colored people there's like a lack of information and it's very it takes a very it takes a toll on us as kids and as we grow older if we don't ever get that information 
it leads you down somewhat of a, a, a difficult path, especially if you only get your information from media and from society and from what they label you as, as you being a thug because of your clothing or because you being this, because of the way you talk, your vernacular. I feel like none of that is fair. And yet with one class, all of these, you know, socioeconomic problems can be shifted with giving information. And I feel like when you said information is empowering, it's very empowering. It's almost the thing that changes lives. I feel like it is. It has changed my life. Me going through manhood development, I was challenged to redefine what it is to be a black man and what it is to be a black boy in, in, in society and in America. And also in those classes, when you come from a home where you have a single mother, you don't get very many good black male role models in your life. And so initially on my first day in this class, I'm being called a king and I'm, I'm experiencing a whole new type of energy that I've never experienced before that it really does open your eyes and it really does change your perception of who you can be and what is expected of you. Cause they expect great things out of you that society really doesn't. Like they don't ask very much of you and they expect you to do the least. Yet when you're put in certain spaces, you can excel past a lot of, a lot of barriers that a lot of people didn't even know we could do. Well, I think you've also answered your own question too. Why is it that they don't teach you this from early on? It was because they don't have expectations of you. And you have to look at it in the larger sense of the society, you know, that um, uh, the society has not equipped itself to basically uh, help African Americans uh, develop and achieve. Uh, it's not been in their best interest, but it's been in our best interest, okay? And so uh, as a result, you know, when you start, when I was on the, um, on a couple of boards in San Diego, and we talk about things and they'd say, well, we're gonna have this program and they would put together these programs that were very minimal in terms of what uh, kids were gonna do when they graduated and what they were gonna become. And I'd always stand up in the meeting and said, well, you know what, I want a program that helps my kids become to take your job as a CEO. And they would look at me kind of shocked and I'd say, I know you saved it for your son, but I want my son to have it. Or I want someone else's son who's African-American or Latino to have your job. And so that becomes, you know, that becomes a reality that, that you're creating a population to compete. And, and it's no, you know, and, and whatever we put out there in the air is what people will do. It's, it's um, you know, it's no, it's no accident that uh, when I go into a classroom with boys and I say, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they all want to be a basketball player or a football player. There's no question. There's no, that's not by accident. That's by program. You know, they've been programmed to be that. And so as a result, when you tell them every day that they're going to be an athlete or a basketball, or you create the experiences that allow them to do that, not that that's a bad thing, but you create that as the only experience that they have, then they don't think about engineering. They don't think about being a lawyer or a doctor and all those kinds of things, because that's not what they're being programmed to be. And that's why it's so important to have different kinds of history that you can see. There's a movie you should see called The Bankers. If you haven't seen that one, that is a good movie. It's a true story about these two black guys who basically almost own all of downtown LA. And it's called The Bankers. And it's their story. And it's funny because when I saw the real picture of them, I remember seeing them when I was a kid, when I was raised in LA, these guys, and, and all the different times they would be in the news or what have you, but they're called The Bankers. And it's a, an amazing story to see it in, uh, on TV. It's on, on the, I think on the Disney Channel or whatever, but it's called The Bankers. And, uh, and it really is a story about these, these two black guys who began to buy real estate and buy property and owned um, uh, almost all of LA and how the system worked against them. Uh, but they still rebounded and did some things, but it's really important to see that movie because that's also a piece of history we never hear about, you know, that we don't see in terms of those entrepreneurs and those guys who are, were working to do these things. So it's really important. Anybody else have any other comments or questions? I'm inspired by the things you guys are saying, which is really, really important. And I think uh, it would be wonderful for our assembly members to hear your testimonies about what ethnic studies truly mean, means to you and how it is helping you define a better future for yourself, which is so extremely important. Um, I actually have a comment about ethnic studies. Um, I first just want to say, Dr. Webster, thank you so much for that full just giving full of just oh my gosh life I can't even speak right now because of what you were saying because everything that 
you were teaching me right now and teaching all of us right now, I never really got that information from ethnic studies. And because for me, I go to a predominantly white school, uh, San Francisco School, school, of, school of the Arts, I'm sorry. Um, my ethnic studies class was very just, it, for me, it was really confusing because I had a teacher, she was great, but she also was not a person of color. And some of the lessons that she was teaching, it would kind of confuse me because one minute we would be talking about uh, indigenous land and then the other minute we would be talking about Christopher Columbus. And I just feel like with, eth with ethnic studies, especially for the African American community and the Latina community, I feel like we need to really go in depth about our own history because not everyone knows our history. And going back to hip hop, Hip hop was a very, very, for me, cause I'm very old school. I do not listen to none of the new school rap because it's just full of dumb information that our youth really does not need, especially at a time like this, where we all should be coming together and not trying to unify. Well, no, are, we are trying to unify, but not trying to go against each other because we, we, we need each other more than we, need our, than we need just anyone. We just need ourselves and our people. So I feel like with ethnic studies and the way it's being taught, all the information that you gave out, I was never taught that in ethnic studies. I was always taught about, you know, how the slaves came, how you know slaves were not being able to do this and how much power that we had but at the same time i wasn't getting taught all of the right things that i should have been getting teached about my own people versus when i look on social media i have to see different types of information that could be false or it could be true so i feel like with ethnic studies it really should be really educational and not just so much as focusing on one specific event. It should be focused on all types of events that have happened in our history. Because there's a lot of hidden facts that not everyone in the world knows about their own uh, country or their people. So again, I just feel like with ethnic studies, again, we, just, we need more facts. We just need more of the support to be able to talk about our own community and our own backgrounds instead of a teacher that is teaching ethnic studies to different groups of people. But when it comes to talking about uh, indigenous history or when it's talking about African-American history, all of a sudden you get scared because you don't know whether you're saying the right facts or you're saying the facts that you're reading on a book. And instead of you teaching us from a book, how about you teach us what you know, and then maybe we can all come together as a group and learn from each other. Because really, youths can really learn from each other. Because nowadays, it's just so, you can get information from anywhere, to be so honest. So when, I, when I'm in, when I, well, when I used to be in a classroom, I used to want to learn from different types of groups that, that didn't look like me, or I wanted to learn from a group that did look like me. So I just, again, with ethnic studies, we just need to really come together and learn off of each other, because all of us are very creative and have a lot of information to share with each other. So true, so true. And, and part of, you know, the, the, the one thing about teaching is, is at least with, when I taught for years, um, um, you know, I, I was equally interested in hearing what my students had to say, uh, because I figured you could read the book and hear and see the facts. Okay, uh, what I wanted to do was take would make an effort to kind of synthesize the facts and help you do that, so that um, I'd sometimes walk in the classroom and write three words on the board, and that would be the discussion for the whole day. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm challenging you to, to think and to do something differently and to and to create your own information based on the stuff you've been reading to bring it back together because, you know, as you can see now you can you can Google anything and find out the factual information. You can get the date, time and place if you halfway get the 
the spelling right of, of an incident or, or an event, you can pretty much get the information you want. Uh, but it's, it's something else when, when you've got this information that's there and all of a sudden you got to bring it all together and make sense out, out of it. So that you then begin to understand why these events took place, why this takes place, why is it the lack of information about this, but you get lots of information on that, you know. I can pick up a book as I tell students and I look at the, I look at the uh, table of content and I can tell you exactly what the book is about. You know, I can look at the back and see if there's any documentation and I can tell you whether or not it's a, it's a, it's a strong nationalist book or whether it's, a, it's something that somebody created to make other people feel good, okay? I can do that simply by looking at the content and get some sense of why, because of the information that they pull together. You know, if I get a history book and there's no discussion of Marcus Garvey, I got a problem with that, you know, because that, it, Marcus Garvey was such a profile, powerful figure in African-American history. That's what I did my dissertation on. And when I discovered, and when I was a senior at UCLA, and I had never heard of Marcus Garvey, I was mad. I was mad because I had, you know, I had not heard of this man. And so I just started digging into Marcus Garvey and discovering that he was a foundation for Malcolm and the foundation for the nation. And that he had done all these amazing things, you know, in just a short period of time. And so I was like, well, why have they hid this man from me? You know, why haven't I learned about Marcus Garvey? Uh, and I hadn't. And so that was really upsetting to me because he was challenging the system that was there. And they put all their energy into destroying him. So, you know, so a lot of times you, you even after you get to a certain point, even now, I, I still find things that interest me that I read about this historical facts or people that I didn't know about because it's a never ending quest for knowledge and, you, and, and you'll never get to the point where you know it all. You'll find new books and, and things to read. You know, when I was talking to Mr. Medina at the beginning, he was finding new books to buy and new books to read because that's what we do. You know, you, this thirst is so great. And especially since we're in a, almost in an environment where it's like a desert where nobody's giving us this information we want on all the different ethnic groups, and then we don't have it. I feel very uh, uneducated about Latino history and Latino literature. And so I'm constantly trying to figure out how I can get more of that and how I can maybe join a reading group to get some books on that because I want to know this. And I'm trying to figure out why has all this information been hid from me? You know, why don't I know more about it? When I went into the museum at Sacramento, the Railroad Museum, it was interesting because my, my first thing my daughter was like, dang, I didn't know so many Asians have to build a railroad. I said, yeah, you know, so she walked in and, and there was all these, these, these uh, uh, um, uh, pictures of individuals and stuff that gave us a, <laughs> they were a completely different sense of history about <coughs> built the railroads in California, you know, and, and that stuff was not really readily available in terms of information. So uh, we're constantly seeking to bring out the, 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 the information because when you bring out that information, it changes your view of the world you live in. It creates a different level of appreciation for all those people who gave so much for you. You know, um, I'm constantly learning things about my father, about my family, about I, I, my father. We came to California. I didn't know till I was an adult that he came to California because they were going to lynch him. I was a little baby. I was a little girl at the time. But he was a person who stood up for his rights. And uh, he had to leave out in the middle of the night to prevent being lynched. And then he had, he worked in California and brought all of us out, but he was courageous because every four years we went back to Arkansas so they could see his face because he wasn't afraid of him, you know? And so when I learned that, it immediately changed my perception of my father that I love very dearly, you know, how courageous he was. And it helped me to understand also why he was not willing to share a lot of his information with people he worked with because he felt they were always working against him. You know, he had limited education, he was working in a factory, and they were constantly trying to get him fired and this and that. And then I began to understand why he didn't have a lot of white friends, you know, and those kinds of things, because he was working to take care of his wife and his kids. And, and he had already been subjected to some negative things in his life. And so he didn't have this level of trust and engagement. You know, it helps to understand, you know, because you don't know, and your parents and grandparents oftentimes don't tell you these things because you know, they tell you things that they had to go through sometimes doesn't make them look very strong or very whatever they think might be. But you should ask some questions because in the process, you learn about yourself, you learn about the courage that you had, and you learn about things. And that's when sometimes people say, oh, Dr. Weber, you're so courageous, you're this, you're that, you know, and you're unafraid. And I said, no, I know people who knew fear. And so therefore, I have nothing to be afraid of because just, you know, standing in front of the Islam arguing for things that are right is not something that I'm afraid of. But I recognize that my father faced fear 
you know, of those trying to kill him. And if they had killed him, there would have been no justice. That would have been it at that time. There would have been no trial, no discussion, nothing in Arkansas if they had killed a black man in 1951-52. He'd have just been dead, okay? And so you kind of understand that and you begin to appreciate it. So knowledge, you know, our history gives us the kind of knowledge and information that helps us to appreciate ourselves, also helps us to avoid the errors of the past, you know, uh, keeps us focused moving forward, uh, helps you to understand why people don't want to give you information or haven't helped you get the information, but it motivates you even more to fight for it, to go and get it, you know, because you don't, because you know, once you get it, it's going to be invaluable to you. Anyone have any other comments or questions? Um, I just wanted to lift up a couple of things. Okay. Um, and I want to appreciate you, uh, Dr. Weber, for all of the, uh, the game you dropping on us. Uh, uh, my name is Khalil Chapman. I'm a media coordinator and youth, ed uh, youth educator for Kingmakers of Oakland. Um, I'm a junior from Sacramento State. Um, and I really just wanted to add that uh, ethnic studies is an introduction to world study outside of the Eurocentric narrative. Um, and I feel like with what um, Sister Alexis and Hema were sharing with having white teachers teaching in um, ethnic studies classes, um, is there, is, there isn't really a space for Eurocentricity. So when you're bringing up um, Native Americans, when you're bringing up African American history and you're centering it around, you know, right. understand what was happening in, in white spaces, um, you, you maintain the Eurocentric perspective and the Eurocentric right. narrative. So um, I just wanted to share that I, I had a, my, my white principal actually was the teacher of my African American history class in high school. And it was one of the worst experiences I ever had in a class. I would argue almost every single day um you know what i'm saying i ended up with a b plus and argued because of that um so i i just feel like that is is one thing that as we establish these courses in our in our state we can't have um space for eurocentricity in these ethnic studies classrooms um and i just wanted to share another point that i or um another couple of points that i had written down while you were speaking um and one of uh, which is black children and children of color spend 13 to 14 years in school systems that don't do anything in service of who they are as people. Um, so traditionally or uh, educating them from the, the, the Eurocentric perspective um, becomes secondary when their life is a balancing act between multiple worlds. Um, so school has to become a more meaningful and equitable space. And I think that uh, not only does uh, ethnic studies do that, but it also provides like you said, like a mentor, a teacher who understands what that other world is like, what, what balancing those two, those three worlds is like. Um, so it really can be a safe space for students of color. It can be a space of growth um, and also a space of recognition and acknowledgement um, of, of culture, of history um, and their identity. So those are just the points I wanted to lift up. I wanted to appreciate you again for um, all you've shared with us, the student panel. Um, and yeah, it's a blessing to be here with y'all. So. Well, thank you. I mean, it's amazing the things that you said. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, and it is so true. You know, we have to be very careful in terms of, of um, when we're putting out information, when we're, we're developing ethnic studies departments and those kinds of things, it becomes real important that those who teach those uh, courses understand Eurocentric ideas how they, how, and how to get rid of them in terms of how not to make us uh, all centered around that and make those events determine uh, all the other things that happen uh, because that, that's very easy to do. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's so important. Um, this bill I have that, uh, that deals with ethnic studies at the CSU is so important because it will require those to take classes in it and to be challenged. You know, oftentimes right now, what we have are lots of people teaching ethnic studies who are not qualified to teach ethnic studies, uh, whether they're black, white, or whatever, because they're only pulling it from a book somewhere, and they've not had enough knowledge to basically provide you with a comprehensive set of information and connect the dots for you in terms of education. And, uh, and so it becomes critical that those folks who are going to teach it in your institutions, in your high schools, or wherever it may be, that those folks know what they're teaching. And we don't have a lot of folks qualified to teach ethnic studies in the K-12 setting. And that's why it's going to be so important to make sure that those who get the degrees 
have had the experience. And hopefully once we do that, we can even require more things of them or they will require more of themselves so they can really understand the students they're teaching and the information. And I mean, ultimately the goal in life would be at some point as, as, as one of you pointed out that you know people have learned about Christopher Columbus ever since the beginning of time. At some point it would be good uh, to have this kind of knowledge that we have fully integrated into the curriculum so that you can't talk about uh, what life was like in terms of the pilgrims or whatever if you're not talking about the Africans that were in that particular space at the same time and what was happening in the world around it. And so it becomes so, you know, so, and, and that's one of the challenges in terms of trying to get a complete re-education and restructuring of education so that it can do that comprehensive job. But until we get to that level, we have to still have these separate experiences uh, to get that information to them so that when you become a teacher and, and you decide to do some things, your knowledge base is much greater. And as you teach, whether you're teaching uh, overall American history or whether you're teaching folks on, on African American history or Latino history, you have a much more comprehensive view of the stuff that you're teaching versus someone else. And it's really important really important and we shouldn't treat ethnic studies as if oh well like sex ed oh well um you know you can go teach sex ed because you didn't have enough students and so everybody knows when you get a teacher teaches sex ed like that opens up the book pass out a few things give a lot of misinformation and that's it uh versus someone who is really trained to teach sex education and knows how to do it how to appropriately discuss issues and how to build a curriculum and that's what's really important that this should not be a default class that whoever didn't get enough students now teaches ethnic studies, you know, that teaches black studies or Chicano studies. It should be purposeful and thoughtful that those who are teaching it are qualified and prepared to teach it. And this is their discipline that they want to teach and that becomes important. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other comments, questions? Yeah, I actually wanted to like add to something that a lot of people were saying. So I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Hema Quetzal. I'm the former student board member um, on the California State Board of Education. I'm from East Oakland and I'm a community organizer. And one of the points that I feel like a lot of people are making is that when we're building a curriculum, when it comes to ethnic studies that we want to bring to our young people, it needs to be more than also just sharing the histories of people that have been erased for so long. Yes, ethnic studies is about that, but I feel like something else that needs to be a part of ethnic studies is giving the tools to our young people to understand what questions do they need to ask in their everyday life when they're approaching life? How do they identify microaggressions? How do they challenge white supremacy in their everyday life? How do they challenge the racial bias they may face in the future? And not only for our students of color, black and indigenous students, but also for white students to understand what it means to be a white ally and accomplice when we're doing this work. Because what we want for ethnic studies is not only our young people to learn about their own history, but share that knowledge and challenge everyone in every single space that uplifts white supremacy and whiteness. And so um, I feel like that's just super important. I really wanted to make that comment because there's this misconception that you're only teaching our young people their history, but it's more than that because our history is giving us the tools to fight against the stuff, um, fight against white supremacy every single day. Um, and that's why, the, uh, right. And that's why we say education is empowering. You know, it empowers you to be the person that you need to be and it, and it provides you with the answers as well as the tools to create the answers to questions that people have, you know, uh, and that becomes important because uh, it's not always going to be a package deal in terms of you getting the exact question somebody else got. Uh, you often have to put the information together yourself and analyze it, you know, uh, and, uh, and be prepared to defend your existence and, and prepared to defend the existence of others. You know, that's what, that's what it's really all about in terms of creating for yourself the space that's good for you, but space for others as well. Yes. I think we have five minutes left for questions. Okay. Anyone else? Any other comments, questions? I have a comment. Um, my name is Julia and I'm a senior at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and my question is kind of as someone who absolutely has white privilege and wants to be the best ally I can be, how can I work in a space in Missouri where often like White people are sometimes the only people that are given a space, which is wrong, but the people there are just so hateful and the discrimination is so just right in front of you. I mean, the housing discrimination, the discrimination in education, like Ferguson just got their first majority black school board, their first mayor. I mean, that's just crazy to me. Um, so kind of how can 
in a university space, in a community space, coming from somewhere like California, where the populace just as, as a whole, I think is more comfortable talking about these things. How can we start to facilitate these conversations and tie them to kind of productive conversations that go in line with voting and go in line with talking about redlining and things like that? How do you suggest we, or anyone, but Dr. Weber, your comments have been just so profound to me. How do you suggest we go about trying to start that transition in Missouri? Because I mean, there's so much activism, but the government just isn't budging at the moment. Um, yeah. so kind of love to hear your thoughts. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's like people tell you, how do you eat an elephant one small bite at a time? And um, that's how you deal with any system. You know, you pick an issue that's really important to you because if you like, if you like most of us, you look at the situation and say, oh my God, it's just so much to do. I gotta go this and this and this and this and this. And, and I, I start, I then generally for myself, I step back and I said, okay, let me see what I can solve in the next six months, you know? Let me see what I can do. And then that motivates me to do more because then I started, my friends always laugh because then I'm always dragging them into the, whatever I'm doing, you know, whatever. They goes, oh my God, Shirley has another program for all of us. I do because you're my friend and you're supposed to be in there with me. But, but you start with something small and you figure out what the problem is. And then you start trying to solve that problem. You know, it's like if you, if you discover that one of the challenges is that in Missouri, the schools are really horrible and the kids are struggling and they're not getting any support, you know, then you find a group of kids who you can help, you know, that you can really, and, and you'll be surprised once you help the four or five kids and you start going to wherever they live and kind of tutoring them and helping them, uh, they will bring you others and then it will expand into some other things and you'll meet some organizations and some folks who can help you do it. But you start small, you know, uh, it's like when I decided to go to Africa, it was a small group of us. And when I ended up with in, in South Africa after many years of my program there, um, you know, we, the, we went there with uh, 46 kids one time and MTV followed us uh, because we were doing such amazing work with, uh, with, with young people there in South Africa and the, with the high school students. And, and how they started going was because I was going and my girlfriend wanted to go. And I said, well, you can only go if you bring some students with you. And she was a high school teacher. She goes, oh my God, now I got another project. Yes, you do. And so we started working on that project and it just expanded, you know? And, and so you, you start off with, with what you want to accomplish and then you just start working on it. And it may be, and it may start off small in the beginning, but you will see the impact of it. And that's what you need to do. You've got a lot of things coming up this year. You've got elections coming up. You know, you need to motivate people to get out and vote, that people need help figuring that stuff out. You know, so maybe that's part of you hook yourself to whatever party you're with or whatever group on campus that's decided they're going to do elections and help them to do that. You meet with the president of the Black Student Union and say, you know, I may not be Black, but I want to be an ally. You know, I want to help with whatever you're doing. And, and, and it's important to say I want to help because oftentimes people go in and want to run something and then that makes people mad. They say, well, how are you going to walk in and you're going to think because you're a white girl that you're going to take over everything? No, you're not. You know, what you're going to do is you're going to help us get there and eventually those communities, like they always do, they embrace those. They embrace them and ask them to come and be a part of them. And then you bring others with you, that's important. And then you form a, a really strong coalition that's there. Uh, it's always important to do that, you know, to work that in. And the great thing now with Zoom, if you, if you get a situation and you need me to come and talk to them for a minute, you know, it's easy for me to get there now because I don't have to pay for a hotel, I don't have to pay for a plane, I just pay for my electric bill to turn on my, te my, my computer and I can Zoom. So. You, you, you seek those who can help you, you know, but you have the right idea, you have the right desire, and, and, and we need powerful allies to help change the world because it's going to be changed by all of us, not just by one group, and that's what you have to do. You know, you have to really do that. Um, when I was, uh, when I looked up and Obama had, uh, had, had gotten a situation where he had been nominated, and I was so shocked because it was in Iowa, wherever it was, I told someone, I, I, I wrote this article called, uh, uh, planting trees without seeing the forest. And I had to recognize myself that probably for 30, 40 years, I had been actually educating students, all colors, all races, all groups to change the world. And I said, I just been planting these trees and I woke up one morning and there was a forest. And that happens, you know, because all of my students now are out there working and campaigning and raising issues and, and bringing change and calling me from all over the world. And so it's really important that you just plant one tree at a time and you don't worry about it because eventually you will build a forest and that forest will bring the change that you want. 
Listen, I want to thank you guys for giving me such a great afternoon. I really appreciate it. Thank Mr. Thurman for inviting me to be a part of it. Thank my good friend, Mr. Medina, for being a part of it as well. I know our time is up, and, uh, but I have enjoyed my afternoon more than I've enjoyed most afternoons in a long time. So I really want to thank you all for, uh, for allowing me to be a part of your day. And I wish you well. I know you're going to have a great time with the others, but keep in mind, you know, you stand on the strong legacy of ethnic studies. And so many of us have spent in 30, 40, 50 years uh, building ethnic studies departments for you. And, uh, and we plan to continue to be the advocate for it. And I know you will too, because you see the value of it in your life. So once again, thank, thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Assemblywoman Weber. We're so thankful for your time and your, your wisdom that you shared with all of us today. Uh, I believe that even today we are planting seeds and we're gonna see a forest grow. Uh, very soon and I know that viewers across the state and uh, on zoom as well as Facebook live are are tuning in nodding uh, and just sharing their their gratitude for today's space and want to thank the students for you know sharing their stories and understanding the the power that they have so um, thank you for joining us today um, I am going to transition over to our state superintendent to give some closing remarks and also want to just put a plug that we will be having other uh, webinars next week and throughout the month of July around ethnic studies. So take it away, State Superintendent. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weber. You know, in the assembly, we all had a tradition. No one ever wanted to speak after Dr. Weber speaks. And, and you can see why. Uh, she has so much to share. Um, all you want to do is listen and take notes like I've been doing as Dr. Weber has been speaking. Um, I also want to thank the students for sharing their knowledge. Uh, we got a double treat today in that Dr. Weber was teaching, our students were teaching. In fact, it was our students who really asked to have ethnic studies, which is how we got to creating this series. So I want to thank our students. I do want to acknowledge we have students from CDE's Youth Advisory Council. We have the Kingmakers of Oakland who participated today. We have students from Mecha and from the Chicano Latino Youth Leadership Project and from Improve Your Tomorrow. We also had uh, an alum of the State Board of Education, a student member, and we also had an alum of the California uh, Student Council Organization, also an alum. We thank you for what you shared. Uh, you know, Dr. Weber is a sought after speaker, uh, and she came and gave this message from her heart. Um, and so just know how special it is that we all receive this today. Dr. Weber, you talked about the thirst for knowledge being great, and uh, it seems to me from everyone's questions and comments that you gave us something to really drink on in terms of filling and quenching that thirst. Thank you uh, for that, and we hope that you'll come back. This is a kickoff series. We hope that you'll come back. You said you hadn't been in the classroom in a while. We hope that you'll come back and kick it with us in the virtual classroom. Um, and exchange ideas with our students. As Cindy mentioned, we're doing this again next week and every week for the next three Tuesdays. Um, and we hope that you'll come back. And even after that, we hope that you will continue to be in conversation. Uh, Dr. Weber, you are a treasure to all of us. Thank you for what you shared. Um, thank you for not just the history. You gave history, but you gave it a personal context and you did what you always do. You speak in a truthful, direct and straightforward way in ways that people need to hear and understand. I'm grateful for you, we are grateful for you, and hope that you will continue to be with us on this journey. Because there are many who are telling us that we should not be providing ethnic studies to our students. And we are moving forward to make sure that ethnic studies will be available. We thank you Assembly Member Medina for sharing your um, expertise and your knowledge and from being the author of a bill that will actually make ethnic studies a requirement in our high schools in California. We thank you for your bill, Dr. Weber, making ethnic studies a requirement in our, in our higher education programs and, and addressing training. Uh, so thank you everyone for what you've been a part of next Tuesday. We're gonna do this again. Um, we welcome back Assembly Member Medina. If you're available, we welcome back Assembly Member Dr. Weber. Next week, we'll also have special guest Dolores Huerta, who many of you know worked hard and campaigned hard to expand ethnic studies, not just in this state, but in other states. Um, we're grateful to all of our young people. Um, please continue to be well and safe, and uh, we look forward until seeing you again. For now, we are adjourned. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there, everybody.